appreciate the, the testimonies and I'm just about to say a big amen to everything that's been said already and hopefully just add to that. I was thinking as we were singing and worshiping, uh, Sister Bridget mentioned that we were talking last night and uh, I as an individual have come to the realization that, that music cannot take me uh, to the throne of God. Music cannot get me to worship God. Mm -hmm. Music may reflect that worship of God that's in my heart, but if you're coming uh, to church expecting to uh, worship uh, the songs, the worship leaders, the whoever they, the singers, the players, the dancers, um, will bring you before the throne of grace, mm -hmm. it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul said that we now may boldly come right. uh, before the throne of grace. Yeah. And, and that music can't take you there. Uh, the band can't take you there. Uh, Sister Bridget can't take me there. But you know, she can reflect where I am or where I'm going or where, where I want to go. And worship is, is the attitude of the heart. Uh, it's a, we're involved in worship all the time. Uh, our lives are to be a worship before God. Our hearts are to be a worship before God. It's not something we do for a few minutes at the beginning of each service. Uh, worship is something that we're doing right now. Uh, so worship is something that we're doing at home. Uh, you can worship you can worship the God of this world by sitting there and watching TV all day. Uh, you're worshiping. Uh, the, Jesus said, uh, speaking of Israel, they worship, they know not what. Uh, how many of God's people still today are worshiping? They don't even know what they're worshiping. They don't understand you worship your job. When you let your job control your life, instead of you controlling your job, you're worshiping your job. Uh, you can worship your boss. You can worship your bank account. Uh, you can worship your time. Uh, and everybody says, well, I'm worshiping God, and yet uh, they're, they're going to do whatever it takes to get a million pounds. I don't, you can say you're worshiping God, but you're worshiping money. Uh, you're worshiping the, the God of this world. You're worshiping man. Uh, Jesus said you can't serve two masters. You're going you're gonna to serve one, and you're going to hate the other. Uh, you know, because uh, you're going to hate. See, you can be sitting in church. You can be meeting with someone, and you can hate being there because, you know what? Today's double time. Today's trouble time. You know? You're looking at your watch. Why? Because you really don't want to be here. You want to be making the, the 30, 40 pounds an hour you can be making right now. Because it's double, triple, quadruple time, whatever. So you're going to love one and hate the other. You know, it's like, man, as soon as this service is over, i got to get, I got to get, because at least I can still be eight hours. Now, I'm not against you making money. Please, and don't get me wrong. But, but what are we serving? Uh, what are we worshiping? Are we truly worshiping God? Well, God wants me to rest today. Well, 40 pounds an hour, that's pretty good money to be resting. But you know, God, God instituted a day of Sabbath, a day of rest. He says, in six days shalt thy work, but on the seventh, you're going to rest. <coughs> Why, that was for your, your health. <laughs> you know, what are we worshiping? And so we, we have to understand when we come before uh, the throne of God, or when we want to come before the throne of God, the music can't take us there. The, the, the worship leaders can't take us there. It's got to be an attitude that we willingly come before the throne of grace. We want to be there. I want to be before the throne of God. And uh, not rely on anyone else or anything else. And so when I come together, when I come here today, my hands easily go up. I don't need uh, the band to, to, to take me there. Uh, right. I'm glad they're here. That's keep right. Playing. You know, keep keep singing the song of Zion, mm -hmm. but I don't need you there to take me there. I can get there all by myself, and if, and if I don't, you're not going to take me there. How many of us have come to worship to services and we left them? I don't feel anything. If the band could have taken me there that day, they would have. But they failed too that day because why? Because they can't. Mm -hmm. It's not that they failed, that they can't. And so, uh, we must, we must work out our own salvation uh, with fear and trembling. And another thing and that I want to speak to you today, and, and the time is, is spent uh, really, but it's been spent in a wonderful way. I wouldn't take, I wouldn't take a thing away uh, from today. I appreciate everyone that, that spoke. I appreciate everyone that worshipped. Uh, but I do feel that we, as children of God, must still develop our relationship with God. Uh, we must develop a relationship and we must lose uh, this idea that we have to be good enough. 
This is something that is culturally, uh, environmentally, wrongly established in our minds. We have always had to be good enough. Uh, we need it. We need to be good in school. We need to have good grades. Uh, we needed to be good at home. We needed to be good. If you were good, you got sweets. If you were bad, uh, you know, you may even have missed dinner. Uh, if you were bad enough, you might have been sent to your room hungry. Uh, in some cases, um, we've all we've developed this mentality that we have to be good enough, and this is a mentality that when we come before God, we have to lose. You are not going to be good enough. We never have been. We never will be. And God is a good God. God is a wonderful God. God is a forgiving God. We must uh, realize that God is not a God up there that is uh, requiring. God is not requiring goodness out of us. Uh, and now when I say that, I want you to realize He's not wanting us. He's not requiring goodness. He's putting goodness into us. That's right. Do you see what I'm saying? He's not requiring it out of us. Uh, it, it's, it's, and I, I know you use this example all the time, but I'm going to keep using it because we must come to the point where we realize that you don't have to heal yourself before you go to the doctor, before you go to the hospital. You know, how many of, how, how many, how long would the NHS survive if all the patients waited until they were healed before they went and said, oh, what was wrong with you? How many people would die if they waited until they were better to go to the hospital? How many people are dying because they're waiting until they're good enough to go to church? You know, we have to lose this, this mentality that with God, He is demanding this, this goodness, this perfection of us. No, he's, he's, he's working, he's healing us. Just like the, the, the hospital staff is, is not demanding health from us before we enter, they're working to put health into us. They're working to establish health back to us. That we may leave the hospital and live life. Right. Uh, you see what I'm saying? God is working in be ye holy, as I am holy, uh, saith the Lord. Uh, but you know what? I can't. You know, I, I can't, just like I can't heal myself when I'm sick. Mm -hmm. I need someone mm -hmm. that can heal me. I need someone that can restore my health. Amen. I need someone that can work holiness into me because I can't be holy on my own. And so uh, we, must, we must continue to see God. Uh, the scripture says, uh, Jesus, not Jesus, God's, the scripture says of God, He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Okay? And so we must, we must understand that God is the same God, whether it was before the world was created, while the world was being created, while the time, the time of Adam and Eve, the time of the fall in the garden, the time of Abraham, the time of Moses, the time of David, the time of Isaiah, the time of Jesus, the time of Paul, the time of Sister Michelle. <laughs> you know, during, the, during this time, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Mm -hmm. God is the same. And what, what, what does God look like? Well, Jesus said in John the 14th chapter, and, and I won't take too much time, but I want to go over this. I want to hit this. And, we're going to hit this a lot this year. I'm sorry, we're just going to go over this stuff a lot because we need to understand who God is. Um, we, we've got a pretty good grasp on Jesus. But you know, the point wasn't for us to be reconciled to Jesus. Jesus came, Paul said, that he may reconcile all things unto God. Our, our, our purpose here and it's the same as Jesus' purpose was. And that's to glorify the Father. Our, your, your whole salvation is a uniting, a reconciling back from fallen, the fallen human state in which we found ourselves as an enemy of God back into a friendship with the Father. Back into sonship. Uh, back into 
to daughtership uh, with God if, if you're female. And so the the what we're here for is to is to be reconciled, to be brought back in uh, to a standing uh, that we had with God before the curse came. And so what does God look like? Uh, and the the only thing that we have really to see what God looks like is Jesus Christ. Uh, this is where, and, and I'm not necessarily a Trinitarian. Uh, I don't believe that the, I believe that there's the God the Father. I believe Jesus Christ the Son. But I believe the Spirit uh, is the is the life of God. Uh, the Spirit that dwells in God. I'm not necessarily a Trinitarian, other than I the the roles and the. Uh, the, the various offices that they fulfill, I would probably agree with. Um, but here's where the, the, the Trinitarians kind of have a leg up on us a little bit, is that they see Jesus Christ, but they have no problem seeing God when they see Jesus Christ. Right. You know, and, and to some degree, we need to start seeing God when we see Jesus Christ. Right. Not that they're the same person. No. Uh, not that they're necessarily the other side of the same person. But they are the same person. Because Jesus said, uh, he's, he, uh, when he came out, out of his baptism, God spoke through his spirit and said, Behold, my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Uh, starting there, going through various, many uh, different scriptures throughout the gospel, we see that uh, God and Jesus are to us the huge extent the same thing. Uh, and in, in John 14, Jesus said that, um, in, in John 14 and verse 7, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. I uh, see, once you get to know Jesus, you're knowing the Father. That's right. That's right. What, is, what, is, what does God look like? God looks like Jesus Christ. How does God act? How does Jesus Christ act? Right. What does God do? What did Jesus do? This, 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 Jesus came to show us the Father. Right. And, and, and I don't know if you're like me. I'll give you my personal testimony. But you, I, also, I often separated God and Jesus into these two different beings. Where God is this all-powerful, you know, all-knowing all being that you, you become afraid of. You know? And, and I, was, I was praying when I was out walking and exercising uh, this week, and I was like, I was like, God, I'm trying to develop a better relationship with God. That's my personal testimony. It's like, I don't want to call you Father because I conjure up this image of some Roman Catholic priest in this black garment, you know, with a little bit of white showing. It's all pious, and, and you know, he's all holy type thing. And, and, you know, he just, you get this weird image of this holier than thou art, above all of that, uh, type, uh, type of uh, an image developing. And I'm like, God, I'm going to call him either dad or papa or something. Because I want to have this, this image that he's not afraid. See, Jesus was called the friend of publicans and sinners. Now, if God and Jesus are, for all intents and purposes, the same person, then God is the friend of publicans and sinners. He's not, remember when Jesus was sitting at Simeon's house and Mary comes up and starts washing his feet uh, with her tears and drawing, drawing, uh, drying them with her hair. Simeon sitting at the table saying, doesn't even know who this person is. What type of a person is this? If he knew, he wouldn't let her do that. Mm -hmm. See, that's kind of different than the God that, oh, he can't even look at evil. Wait a minute. This is not the same God. Now see, we have to start looking at God through Jesus. That's right. We need to start looking at what, what is God like. It's, it's what Jesus came. Then we can start looking now back at the Old Testament of God through Jesus Christ. Right? And so, uh, I want to get through this um, today. We don't have to spend a lot of time with teas and cakes today because... We're going to dinner afterwards, so uh, you can just uh, we'll, we'll just uh, maybe take a small break and then we'll go right into our into our John Maxwell stuff. But Jesus said, "If you'd known me, you would have known the Father." Do you?
you know Jesus? Do you see what kind of a uh, Jesus is? He comes and dies. You know what? God, if he could, he would have died for you. So he does what he can. He creates the Son. His blood, God's blood, throws through, flows through Jesus' veins, and he pours it out for you. Why? Because our God is a sacrificing God. Not some maniacal, mean, justifying um, God that, my God, everything has to be to the exact, uh, you know, every I has to be dotted, every T has to be crossed. And, and Philip, after, after Jesus makes a statement, see, Jesus says, if you know me, you know the Father, and we don't get it. We don't get it. And, and, and it's not unique with you. It's not unique with me. Philip didn't get it either. Verse 6, will you show us the Father? And Jesus has to rebuke him a little bit. Wait a minute, did you not just hear what I said? If you know me, you know the Father. But, but Philip's like, oh, I, I still got a different God in my head. I have a God in my head that if I don't obey everything, I'm cursed. And Jesus said, uh, Philip says unto him, yeah, Lord, show us the Father and it will be okay now. Have you not been with me, Jesus said? Right. Verse 9, I have been with you so long, and yet you don't know? How long have you been saved? And do you not know what kind of a God we're serving? A God that, you know what, he's waiting till I get all my family problems sorted before he's going to bless me. God's waiting till I get all my financial problems sorted before he's going to bless me. i got to wait till all my health problems are sorted, then he'll bless me. Again, that's, that's works. You're trying to get a good standing with God. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't sort out your problems. And you should pray that it'll help you. But you know what? God isn't, isn't waiting for that. I was thinking as, as uh, my wife was talking about the 120. Do you think the men, the men and women in the, other, the room of the 120 were perfect? Peter had just denied the Lord. Just a few days ago, he had denied the Lord. Not only that, he'd given up and went fishing again. God 
that comes up to the, the man that's been lying by the pool of Bethesda for 38 years. God walks up to him and says, take up thy bed and walk. This is God, the, the man at the gate beautiful. That Peter and John walk up and say, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have. Give I unto thee. This is God. God is not out for to, to, to hurt you. God is out to heal you. God is out to help you. God, not, I'm not talking about Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about the pastor. I'm talking about your Father in heaven is out to help you. He's not waiting for you to be perfect. He's wanting to help you get there. He understands. Just like, just like your natural father. Hopefully everyone had a good good uh, relationship with their natural father. I know I did. And my dad, while at, at times I, I did bring his displeasure, my dad was always there for me. My dad was always there comforting me. We had some, some, some issues, but you know, that was my fault more than his. But Jesus said, Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, he shall do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. And, and, and here's what Jesus' purpose is. Whatsoever ye shall do in my name, I'll, that I'll do, that the Father might be glorified in the Son. I uh, see this is this is the for the glory of God. See the purpose is for God to reconcile all things in him. You can't be good enough. You never will be. Just like the sick can never be strong enough. They need someone to help them. And if you ask anything in my name I will do it. If you love me, uh, you keep my commandments and I will pray, here we go back to what we've been talking about, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he might abide with you forever. See, this isn't waiting. Now, when you guys get good enough, I'll pour out my spirit upon you. No, you just go in the upper room and just wait. I'll be there. With all of your problems, with all of your situations, I'm going to be there, and I'm going to give you power. And, and we've, got to, we've got to lose the attitude and, and, the, and the way of thinking that I've got to be good enough. The one thing that I think uh, Brother Artwell was mentioning, that we're going to turn the city upside down. I pray God that happens. But it's not going to happen with a group of people that somehow think they were good enough. That's right. It's not going to be That's a, right. a group of people that think somehow they did it. Jesus said, whatever you do in my name, I'll do it that God might be glorified in me. Right. And, and if anything we do for the community, right. any glory the church gets, it's only that God might be glorified in That's us. Right. That's right. If the Son is God is being glorified in the Son, and the church is glorified in the Son, eventually the glory goes back to God. Mm -hmm. And that's the point, is for us to be reconciled to our God. He's your Father. We, we all love Jesus. We need to turn, make sure that love is turned even greater to our Father, which is in heaven. And this is one reason why Jesus said, Call no man on earth Father, for you have one Father. And I've come to realize, I'm beginning, I, let me say it this way, I'm, be, I'm, I'm coming to the realization that this top title, Father, is so great, is so wonderful that uh, I don't ever, don't call me your Father. Spiritually, you don't ever call me your Father because there's only one that you're truly connected to, that, that, you're, that really is your Father. And that title should be reserved for God in heaven. You, you come in such a, such a close proximity to Him and such a, uh, such a relationship with Him that he is a, He's a Father to you. He, he's not just some guy up there that must be appeased. How many times have we brought that attitude in? That God must be appeased. Well, I'm sacrificing myself to God. Maybe he'll like it, maybe he won't like it. You know, maybe he'll be happy with that, maybe he won't be able to wait and see. This is not a God, we talk about sacrifice a lot. I'm sacrificing your body on the end of it. In other words, just give yourself over to him. Why? Because of his great love. Yes. See, when we understand.
understand the love that God, and I'm talking about God, when we understand the love that God has for us, our lives become His. Amen. We love Him because He, God, first loved us. And, and so we're going to continue to work on this. I'm not trying to get it all in today. But you know, the, the thought hit me again when I was out uh, walking and praying. And then Paul, I think it was, I don't know if I can find it real quick, but Paul is talking about the work that Christ did. And he said, therefore, we can come boldly uh, before the throne of grace. Uh, I don't know if I can find that now. I think it's somewhere around the, is it the 10th chapter? 416, sorry. Um, yes. Right. So, Paul again in Hebrews is really trying to lay out uh, Christ as the high priest making the way for us and all the things that he did. Uh, verse 14, seeing that we have such a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold our faith, uh, let us hold fast our profession. Uh, for we have not such a high priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in, was in all points tempted like we are, without sin. And, 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 and if we're not careful, we'll, we'll look at this mediator between God and man, and we look at someone that has to kind of go between. You know, as a, a, okay, here's this fierce God trying to mitigate the fierceness to you. But he, but look at it this way, he's the mediator. In other words, he is the, the, the gap closer. He's the bridge uh, between you and God. Uh, he, he brought us back together. And we have a high priest that understands. Uh, we, have, we have God that knows uh, what, we're, what, what we're like in Jesus uh, being his son, he can relate to us uh, because he was tempted like we are. Uh, but and so there's this bridge between us and God. But he's not up there trying to appease this angry God. But he's the bridge that brings us back. He said, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in the time of need. And here's the thought that came to me. When, when you think of verse 16, let us come boldly before the throne of grace. Who are we talking about? Anybody can answer. Who are we talking about? We're coming boldly before the... Who are we coming to? To God. Absolutely. So you're coming to a throne. Who sits on that throne? God. What is that throne made of? Grace. God has always ruled from the throne of grace. It's not ruled from the throne of judgment. He's not ruled. It's not been a, it's not a throne of justice. It's a throne of grace. So when you look back at the, New, the Old Testament, You've got to understand, God was still ruling from the throne of grace. We can come boldly now before the throne of grace. What are you going to obtain there? You're going to obtain mercy and grace in time of need. Because God, I'm not talking about Jesus. We have no problem with understanding grace from Jesus. But you need to understand that when you come before God, you're coming before a throne that is made entirely, not of law, not of works, but of grace. And you can obtain mercy and grace to help in time of need. God's not going to tell you you're not good enough. God's not going to tell you that, I, I'm sorry, you're too pure of a bad character. Get out of my sight. Now, anyone that comes boldly before the throne of grace is going to find the help that they're looking for. Uh, ask and seek. Uh, you've got to ask. Uh, Jesus said, everyone that asketh, uh, receiveth. Everyone that knocketh, it's open to him. Everyone that, uh, how, how does it go? It was asking, seeking, and knocking, wasn't it? If you seek him, the day you seek me with your whole heart, I will be found of you. This is God. He's not hiding somewhere. He's not obscured somewhere. He's not behind some veil somewhere. He 
says, when you seek me with your whole heart, you're going to find me. Because God wants to be found. Now God has, he, he's ruling from grace, not law. He's not, he's not ruling from a thou shalt be good enough attitude. He's like, I'll help you be good. I'll help you be holy. I'll help you find, uh, solve your problems. It, because I've already dealt with the biggest problem, which is sin. A sin and death have already been conquered. That's already over with. He, if, uh, if he not freely gave us his own son, how shall he not freely? And then let's, let's, if God spared not his own son, we're talking about God here. If he spared not his own son, how shall he not freely? Let's, let, let, let's just think about that word freely for a second. How shall he not freely give you all things? That pertain to life and to right. right. You don't have to be good enough. This God loves us. Amen. He loves us Amen. with all of his heart, yes. with all of his soul, with all of his mind. He's wanting you to love him the same way he loved you, Amen. with everything you got. Mm -hmm. I don't care if it's your finances, I don't care if it's your strength, I don't care if it's your thoughts, I don't care if it's whatever you have your hands find to do, do it with all of your mind. Why? Because this is the way that God loves you. Amen. He knows his thoughts towards us. They are more than the sands of the sea. I know my thoughts towards you, God said. They are good and not evil to bring you to an expected end. Why? Because he loves us. Zephaniah 3.17 He's up there singing over us. He make, he, he, his children make him happy. There's, there's joy in the, in the courts of heaven today because of why? Because of the love of God himself. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for a friend. If God himself could have laid down his life for you, he would have. But it was impossible for him. So what has he done? He creates a son that's willing to do it for him. In his name. And you know, in, in his way as well. So we must develop a closer relationship with God. We all need a closer relationship with God that's not based on how good we are. The closer your relationship comes to God, the gooder, excuse me, the gooder you'll come. The more good you will be. The closer you get to God, the more holy you will be. It won't be your holiness bringing you to God. You get to God, you'll become holy. You can never, your holiness can't, your good works can't bring you to God. Nothing you do, not the way you dress, not the way you talk, not where you go, where you don't go. Jesus said it's not what goes into man that defiles him, it's what's coming out. What's really down inside? Right. Uh, what's down in the heart? Uh, the law of God under Moses only dealt with the outside, that which was committed. But Jesus said, he says that the, it has to go inside. He goes, if you commit adultery, you're, you're, you know, you're adulterer. But Jesus said, I want to take it down to the heart of the matter. What's the heart of the matter? He said, that in your mind, if you're already thinking of that woman in your mind, then you've committed adultery. That's right. The Lord is bringing it inside. Yeah. Lord, help yeah. us come a little bit closer to this yeah. God. Yeah. He's not a fierce God. Yes, He is a fierce God to them that, that continually draw that from Him. Uh, if, if, they continue to, uh, if you continue to, uh, I don't know what the word I'm looking for, uh, reject Him, yeah, you're going to find uh, you're going to find that sin will take its course and you will die. And you might even die the second death if you haven't been uh, rectified and justified from that. But if you come to God, either come to God must believe that He is, and that He's a diligent, uh, He's a reward of those that diligently seek Him. Uh, God is real. He's real in my soul. Uh, God is real for He's washed. And they be whole. We're talking about God. Uh, this love, his love for me is pure gold. Yeah. It is just pure gold. And our God is real, uh, for he is real in our soul. And so we must modify uh, how we, we see God and what we think of God. And uh, God will bless us. Uh, not because we're doing good, but because we're going to become closer to him. And who knows what will happen uh, when we come closer to him.